suggest that some dinosaurs are already evolving into birds. 150 million years ago, the first bird took flight and made our once empty skies wild. A mere six million years ago, the first human created the first footprints on Earth. And now, for over 60,000 years, the oldest continuous living culture on Earth, my culture, the indigenous people of Australia, have a connection to the land, the skies, and the wildlife that coexist. This connection, these stories, the knowledge, they belong to the land, they belong to the wild skies. Millions of years of evolution have adapted each of our bird species to find their individual niche and it has pre-programmed them to nest, to breed, to migrate and to feed in their own unique habitat and manner. The indigenous people of Australia, they have connected with all creatures that have roamed these lands. They witnessed animals walk the earth that had once come from the sea and today fly in our skies. And in this relationship that has given us stories that hold the history between the indigenous people and of course these sky spirits. Sky spirits is like the beautiful Australian whiteback magpie here. Magpies, they are believed to be a spiritual custodian and considered to be one positive guide for all. Very well known for those beautiful vocalisations that you can hear at the dawn and dusk periods of the day. But this is Jack, everyone. Let's thank Jack as he flies across Australia and guides us on our wild skies adventure. Now from birds like Jack that love to sing to birds with impressive aerial ability. Like kites, they can be found in a variety of different habitats, from timbered watercourses to open plains. Oh, one of them just doesn't want to catch them. <laughs> yes, they can be found in many different habitats from timbered watercourses to open plains, and they can even be observed in and around outback towns as well. Now, although they are mainly found in small groups, that's fine, they'll be a souvenir for later. Black kites, they are also known to form large flocks of hundreds of birds, something they tend to do particularly during grasshopper plays. Now, no other raptor can actually be seen forming such large groups. In their natural environment, they certainly are spectacular as they soar effortlessly in the wind. Those long four tails that they have are constantly twisting to maneuver the birds as they search for food on the ground below or skillfully catch insects while on the wing. Now, readily attracted to any fire, Great numbers of black kites, they can be seen cartwheeling about in the smoke. In fact, the indigenous people of the Northern Territory, they may oh, no. <laughs> Everyone needs umbrellas for more than just the rain today. <laughs> they do maintain that a collective group of kites are known as firehawks. And they have the incredible ability of being able to control fire. Now how they do this is by taking burning sticks to new locations inside their beak and talons. The whole idea behind this is that these intelligent birds of prey will then use the fire to help them to find food, skillfully making easy meals out of all of the insects and animals that try to flee the blaze that they themselves in fact help to spread. Ladies and gentlemen, they did their best. <laughs> it was Axton that it broke our beautiful black hive. Now, black kites, they are an example of a bird that tends to sh uh, be around where us humans are, but there are some birds that tend to be more elusive and shy away when it comes to human interaction. Now, this next bird that we're going to introduce to you, well, one of their favourite food sources is actually the content inside an emu egg. <laughs> and it looks like it's a little bit wet in here today, she has had a bit of a shower in the rain. Well, her name is Major, and Major is a black-breasted buzzard. Now, these beautiful birds are found... Oh, we need some rocks, don't we, Major? 
Now these beautiful birds are found in our arid interior of Australia. And they have this amazing ability to utilise tools to get to their food. And for a long time, it was thought that, where are you going with your rock? Is it a little bit wet up there? <laughs> Go on, you can do it. It is only a 20 minute show, Major. <laughs> now, for a long time, it was thought that only humans and primates had the ability to utilise tools to get to their food. But around 40 years ago, well, they did discover that also this bird can do that behaviour, and we were actually proven wrong. And it looks like Major might prove me wrong today as well. There we go, have a good crack at it. You didn't quite get it just yet. But you see, the amazing thing is that no bird of prey has talent or a beak that is sharp enough to crack inside an emu egg because they are such a sharp, uh, hard and rough egg to get into. So this bird has learned to pick up a rock inside their large beak and throw it down into an egg to crack into it. Oh, oh sorry, I'm not doing very good at helping you today, am I, Major? There you go. No, we're not. <laughs> Now the other thing about our black-breasted buzzards is that they do often mistaken get, uh, get mistaken for our webtail eagles. And they definitely are not a webtail eagle. And when they are soaring up high in the sky, they can be distinguished by these beautiful white patterns under their wings. Are you going to take the egg off with you, are you? Oh, okay. See you, Major. Bye. Oh, we've given up on the rock. Major, we were going to prove to the audience that you can crack into it with a rock, but if you want to just use your beak, that's fine. <laughs> oh, I think she's figured out how we make her emu egg today, because don't worry guys, this is a fake emu egg. We uh, do make it and we put some delicious food inside so that she can get to the content and get a nice <laughs> reward once she's cracked into it, but Major, it's getting uh, pretty wet out here and you're making everyone watch me get wet in the rain for a little while. But what do you reckon? Gonna have another go at picking up the rock. There we go. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, we deserve a round of applause after that effort. <laughs> has been at the same food with us for a number of years now and the really amazing thing about this behaviour is that we actually don't need to train her to do this. All we need to do is give her the tools, give her that safe in your egg and she, <laughs> and she will do this behaviour purely by instinct which is really impressive. But uh, I would recommend you to get a round of applause from everyone as you head on out of here. A beautiful bird of prey that we are so lucky to have right here in Australia. See you later Major. Uh, uh, and she's gone for a fly in the rain. <laughs> now, like breasted buzzards, they are a bird of prey found in our central parts of Australia. But here in Australia, we have lots of different amazing habitats. We have lots of coastal waterways, especially right here on the Gold Coast. And with those waterways, we have a lot of amazing water birds. And these birds don't mind getting wet in the rain. We've got birds like this guy, our Australian intelligence. This everyone is Marlin, our handsome pelican, he loves coming out in the rain. And male pelicans can weigh in excess of 7 kilos. And check out his wingspan. Oh, he's <laughs> not flying today. All the birds are going crazy here in the rain today. <laughs> now, that wingspan can reach 2.5 metres in length. But check out his most characteristic feature, which I reckon is that elongated bill and that massive throat out. That bill plays a really important role when it comes to feeding for these birds because the lining is really sensitive, so it helps him locate his fish in murky water and he's got that hook that sits at the end of the upper mandible so he can grip onto slippery food items. Pelicans basically utilise that bill just like a fishing net in the wild. So let's show them how it's done, buddy. There we go. What they do is they plunge that bill into the water, using it like a net, they catch up all their fish, they then can maneuver that fish into the perfect flowing position, and then they also can empty out all of the water that they've put up as well. And when fully extended, that bill can hold a massive 13 litres of water. Unfortunately for our pelicans, however, this way of hunting for their fish does leave them very susceptible to being hooked and entangled in active and discarded fishing line, and it does cause very serious injuries to 
such a beautiful bird species. It only takes one careless action that can cause so much harm, and only one positive action to prevent it. I don't know about you guys, why wouldn't you want to protect hands and pelicans just like our mate Marlin? See you later, buddy. Shake your tail feather on out of here. There we go. He's pretty handsome. <laughs> Major's egg away. But during fishing season, some birds have learned to take advantage of modern fishing practices. In fact, our commercial fishing trawlers can provide 70% of the diet of our next little guest, and you can hear him before you see him, and they are known as the little crested tern. <laughs> now these birds are extremely adaptable because they have learned to follow our fishing boats in search of jettison bycatch. And there are very few stretches along our Australian coastline where you can't see these cute little guys feeding. Our moth is doing a pretty good job of demonstrating to you guys today how they love to feed for their food. And it looks like the moat's gotten pretty um, full of water, hasn't it, buddy? So you're struggling to get to your fish because what they do is they dive for their fish. They dive from 10 metres above the water, diving to a depth of one metre below the surface. And they've even been seen 10 kilometres offshore searching for their favourite fish, which just happens to be sardines and anchovies. Now, they are strictly a coastal species of water bird, but there are occasional records of our little crested terns found right in the central parts of Australia. Now, how did they get there? Well, it is thought well that they were blown inland by a passing tropical cyclone. Come on, sir. It's already pretty stormy here today. Let's head out of here because I don't want him getting blown inland. And Monster doesn't like to get wet in the rain even though he's a water bird. Come on, buddy. I'll protect you. <laughs> <laughs> From the heat of the day to the storms that follow, many animals, they will rest, but others will bring the night to life. These are known <laughs> as nocturnal animals. <laughs> Under the cover of darkness, we share our gardens with a surprising range of native animals. And if you look close enough, you will find clues everywhere. From droppings on the lawn in the early morning, to a flash of colour in the tree canopy. Or maybe a scuffle in the bushes behind the rubbish bin. You may not realise it, but your backyard, they could be feeding and housing a surprising range of animals that come alive at night. And of all the unique animals that do emerge at night, there are a few that create a magical ambience quite like an owl. In Aboriginal culture, owls, they are a totem for women and they symbolize the powers of night, mystery, and wisdom. I'm sure we can all agree that there is certainly something wonderful, mysterious and alluring about owls. And right here in Australia, we are lucky enough to have 11 different species that are spread across every state and territory. We would like to now introduce to you one of those species of owls here in Australia, a stealth hunter of the night. The barking owl is one formidable predator and they are widely distributed throughout Australia, although absent from central areas. Now the well-known call of this medium-sized call cow is actually synonymous with that of a dog's Just like that. Now their companion, they can hear that call from up to six kilometers away. Although if unheard, they will rely on their impeccable vision to pinpoint the location of their companion and also the location of their prey. A barking owl's prey mainly consists of large insects, small to medium sized mammals including mice, sugar and squirrel gliders, ring cow possums and also small roosting birds are on the menu as well. Barking owls, they do require a very large territory and monogamous pairs, they can be seen hunting across as much as six thousand hectares. To give you an idea of how large that actually is, our sanctuary right here at Corumbin is set on just 27 hectares. Now we're twice the amount of vertebrae in their neck as we grew up. This means that barking owls like to eat here, 
they have the incredible ability of being able to rotate their head 270 degrees. Now this creates very little disturbance as they try and find their food source. And when they have, what they will do is utilize their completely silent flight in order to ambush their victim. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Tui, and Tui is our beautiful barking owl. <laughs> but with the quiet darkness that ends each night comes the dawn of a brand new day. But things, well, they haven't always been this way. And throughout time, there has been many earth-changing events, some of them cataclysmic, but perhaps nothing more prominent than the extinction of the dinosaurs over 65 million years ago. Now, it is argued that dinosaurs were wiped off the face of the Earth by a meteorite that was really big, travelling really fast. It hit the Earth, wiping out three quarters of all life, including dinosaurs. Or did it? Well, there is in fact still one group of animals that are still alive today, that are the closest living relative to the Tyrannosaurus Rex. So, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Believe it or not, the closest living relative to a T-Rex is a chicken. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, they've done so well out here in the wet today. Our silky venture chickens, T-Rex, Pterodactyl and Triceratops. Just 
Thank you.